Boom. Brian, thank you for coming on the show. So I have to start with, uh, what is your favorite superhero? Oh man, we got right into this. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big superhero guy. Um, I I don't even remember the name of the the movie. Um, but there was one where like the guy could teleport. Um, Uh, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of superpowers. If I had to have a superpower, it'd be the ability to just teleport and be wherever I want, whenever I want. Um, but I never really got into the like Batman, Superman yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little addicted, but also, um, it's a question David Burke was talking about. Just helps like dive in to kind of understand some more. Um, mm-hmm. So teleportation, that's interesting. Is there a reason behind that? Would you say? I, I guess I, I like travel. I like to you know be around amazing people and do great things. So I guess I, I feel like if I could do that, then I could be. Uh, be everywhere or be be all places or be wherever I want whenever I want so awesome awesome so that probably so let's dive back into your story then before uh you wanted the ability to teleport I would say um to when you started uh at college you were learning um, nutrition and really like about the human body and you've had a huge evolution since then but I wanted to really start at the beginning and just get what was that mindset um that helped you build to the better human project to fuck your feelings to all these different things. Yeah. I mean, you're right. That's, we're talking over 10, 12 years, you know, from college to, you know, where we are today and, and, and being an author of fuck your feelings and, you know, co-founder of better human project. But I think all the way back in the beginning of this thing, for me, it was, um, realizing that I needed to take control over my behaviors and, and my life. Um, you know, when I got to college, uh, I did the, the fraternity thing for about two and a half years. And Me too. I just, I just woke up one day and I was like, you know, there's got to be more to life than, than this. And, um, you know, my personality is very all or none. Uh, mm-hmm. Dave Tate is a, a famous power lifter. He calls it blast or dust. And, and I really <laughs> loved that when he wrote about that and talked about it. And I was like, yes, that's me. That's how I, I just, I, I don't, I'm not uh, romanticizing it. I'm not saying it's totally. great. I just, I am aware that that is how I tick. And um, I think that's an important lesson for everyone to learn is, you know, how do you tick? And, and you know, that awareness then gives you the ability to, uh, you know, find your strengths, find your weaknesses yep. and, and kind of prevent them from unknowingly leading you astray or off track. Um, but, you know, the mindset in the beginning was, okay, I've got to take control of this thing. I've got to get my shit together. And, you know, at that point, uh, I was the only male in my family who was not diabetic. Um, so I knew if I wanted to uh, take control, take charge of my health, uh, that I needed to learn what was going on. And I think that's another kind of fundamental mindset that I've always had is I don't want to be in a situation where I have to rely on someone else's advice for how mm-hmm. to do something. So I didn't want a diet coach to to give me a diet. I didn't want a personal trainer to tell me like how to go lift, bro. Like I wanted to know how the body works and I wanted to know like the science of everything. And and I've always had an aptitude for math and science. So kind of numbers and and the science stuff came easy to me. And uh, I changed majors. Uh, I wanted to do exercise physiology, but Clemson didn't have that. Closest I could get was uh, food science and human nutrition. And it was just one of those things where the more I learned, uh, the more fascinated I became. And and the further down that rabbit hole I went, I've always seen my body as kind of this laboratory. We were talking before we hit record that, you know, we we love doing these experiments on ourselves and and in our own lives. And I was tinkering with with every diet that I could read about and, um, you know, doing all these intermittent fasting and low carb. This was way before low carb and, and keto were popular. I think the very first one was called the anabolic diet and it was something Jeff Volick put out and oh, cool. uh, TNT diet. And I was experimenting with all this stuff and different ways of lifting. And I just became fascinated by the way we could manipulate the way we eat, the way we train, the way we sleep, the way we do all these things that we talk about now and get the desired outputs that we want for how we feel, how we perform, how we look. Yeah. And, uh, that was just the beginning of it for me. And, you know, then other people around me started to kind of see what was going on. And they're like, you know, man, you got, you got to help me with this. And, you know, I started helping some of the other athletes at Clemson. And then when I went to New York, I was helping some of the other models. And then, you know, that's where I realized like, Hey, I really enjoy 
coaching people and I saw the gap between what I was learning in the science classes and, and in my own experiments and in helping others uh, versus what the mass media was talking about and what most people thought was the right way to do things. Yeah. So it, it just sort of became my life's passion and, and I felt like it was my purpose to um, you know, educate as many people and help as many people as I can um, you know, live stronger, healthier, happier lives. So yeah. that's, that's kind of the mindset awesome. behind it all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I had a similar story. I was only in a fraternity for two and a half years. Uh, that was at Michigan state, but I was going originally for neuroscience and I was like, I love neuroscience. I love the brain, how it works. The one thing that I couldn't, uh, deal with was the, uh, the brainwashing. I went and talked to a few naturopathic doctors and they're like, dude, if you go DO, like you're going to get brainwashed. And I was like, okay, well I need to figure something out. I remember I was waking up at like 5 AM every day at the frat. And that's very hard to do at a fraternity, but I was like trying to optimize sleep and like do all these things. And then luckily I got pulled out by the startup company and I was like, cool. Now I get to go like pursue what I want to do and like not sit here anymore. Like, Hey, it's Wednesday night and there's a subwoofer going off in the room next to me till 4 AM. <laughs> So I, but I, I completely understand that it comes down to wanting to do things and figure it out yourself and then moving more towards that than anything else. Yeah. And you know, something else that, that you just said that is, is something I shared on a post recently that, you know, don't be afraid to go after what you want in life. And kind of a corollary to that is if, and when you realize that what you thought you wanted isn't serving you, don't be afraid to pivot. Um, you know, so that's, that's exactly kind of the path that both of us have, have taken. And, um, you know, it, it may not be, uh, the path of least resistance, but yeah. to me, the, the authentic path is the one that is most fulfilling and most worthwhile to pursue. Totally. And there's always that con the, there's a misconception. I would say that people are like, but like, what about the people I'm with now? Or what about the place I'm in now? And it's like one, um, you just limit the amount of time that you spend with the people that you're with now, you don't have to cut them out, limit the amount of time. But then two, like you have one life and you're not gonna do exactly what you want to do. And if you start doing that, and don't like it and figure out something else you want, like you have to f probably spend 15, 20 years of going like, Nope, didn't work. Nope, didn't work. Nope, didn't work until you actually do what you want to do. Or you become Warren Buffett, who just sits there from like 20 years old <laughs> and like just invest in like, I mean, I, I always, you know, most people in these circles focus on health, wealth, social. He's only wealth and you can see that. And so he's isolated himself towards that. But right. Right. So you went from going to try to figure out everything you were in the fraternity to developing house of strength. Um, where did the mindset come behind that? And why did you really want to start your own gym and take that into your hands? Well, it's, it's a lot of some of the things that we've touched on already where, um, you know, so when I came back from New York, I got a job as a personal trainer uh, at a gold's gym and did that for a few years. And a buddy of mine and I were, were lifting partners and, um, you know, we used to talk every single day while we were lifting that uh, about the things that frustrated us with, uh, you know, the system and, you know, kind of like what you were alluding to with um, pursuing, you know, your, your yeah. doctorate, um, you know, it doesn't matter what industry or, or what vertical you're in, you know, there's sort of a, an established way or an orthodoxy that does things because that's how they've always been done. Yeah. And, you know, it takes people to who challenge and question that and aren't afraid to say, you know, this could be done better and, and then find a way to do it better. And, and we, I just got tired of having those conversations and said, you know what, fuck it, I'm doing it. Yeah. And just left and, and started my own place. And, um, you know, I found a, a, a hole in the wall, powerlifting strongman facility the best. and, uh, rented space from them for $200 a month. And, you know, they allowed me to, you know, train my clients and build my business out of there and did that for the first year. And then after a year, you know, had enough money saved up to be able to get my own place. Um, and then start, you know, like I said, building it the way I wanted it to, to be, um, so that I could 
train people the way I wanted to train them, mm-hmm. uh, you know, by going from this one-on-one model in a box gym to my place where we did group training, I was able to train without having to answer to anybody. Yeah. I could do what I wanted. Uh, I could use the equipment that I wanted. I didn't have to beg for, you know, the most fundamental pieces of equipment and never get them. Uh, you know, I could make my own equipment. I could do whatever yeah. I wanted there. I could charge my clients significantly less money um, and, and then have them in small groups. So it was a lower price point for the people who came with me. Totally. And then ultimately I made more because I didn't have to give 53% to, you know, the big box gym. So it was a win for everybody. And I mean, I think that's, you know, to me, the mindset there is, you know, look at wherever you are and, and just find ways to turn your current situation into a win for every party involved. Yeah. And that's how you add value and make yourself, you know, indispensable and, and ultimately innovate and move things forward um, in your community or, or in your vertical or whatever it might be. Totally. Yeah. And exactly what you're saying is what a lot of people are afraid to do, which is scratch their own itch. Um, they don't, I feel like often we think it's bad to go your way with, this is referring also to the article that you wrote where when you, when you move this way, a lot of people think, Oh, now you're isolating people or now it's just you in this narcissistic path. And it's like, the more that you go after the thing that you want in life, the more quality you're going to create behind that. And the more quality you create behind that, the more quality that people around you are actually coming into. And so once you do that, like people are getting a better training service at the gym that you mm-hmm. created that is better quality that is scratching your itch with better equipment and better everything like that. You know, that, that's such a great point that so many people need to understand is I would actually argue, and this is kind of agreeing yeah. with you that to not pursue your true calling, to not mm-hmm. pursue the thing you were put here to do is actually the most selfish thing that you can yes. do because you are robbing the world of the thing that you were put here to do. What if Bruce Springsteen never pursued music or Led Zeppelin never made music or, you know, Warren Buffett never pursued, you know, financial investments. Um, You know, Bill Gates didn't do what he did. All of these people who, you know, impact the world, change the world, make it a better place are people who went their way and pursued the thing that they were put here to do. And, And I promise you, if you're listening to this, you know that there is something that you were put here to do. My challenge to you would be, to not view it as a selfish pursuit because if you fail to do the thing you were put here to do, you're robbing the world of your gift and and the people that you can impact and uh, you know, the, the way that you can make the world a better place. Totally. So then with this and with this conversation that we're alluding to, we got to go into fuck your feelings and the better human project. So Let's start because this is more, I feel like, geared right now towards uh, the better human. Mm-hmm. Let's start with that route because, I mean, you're, you were, when you were in the RV, you were planting a tree for every mile that you drove. Um, are you guys registered B Corp? Or you- so, so that is part of the, the long-term plan. There's yeah. an approval process that you have to go through. Uh, you can't just say, Hey, we're a B Corp. Yeah, yeah. You actually have to prove it. Um, and, and you have to go through a little bit of a process, but, um, all of the, the end stuff for setting up the actual business stuff is, um, underway. It's not finalized yet, but that yeah. is the, yes. And so you're, you're taking, your mission is literally to help people upgrade who they are to become that better human. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's very much, you know, we, we talked before we hit record about kind of who your audience is and it's, it's yeah. the same thing. And, you know, at the end of 2017, moving into 2018, I knew the book was coming out. We can talk about that, but I wanted um, my own podcast and, and it was time to, to part ways from the OPP, which yeah. was an amazing experience to get to do that. But in looking at, okay, if I'm setting up a new podcast, the world doesn't need another podcast that is the same thing, right? Yep. So, so Rylan, my co-founder at Better Human Project, um, he and I had numerous discussions of how do we make this thing different and not just different for, for the sake of being different, but different in a way that would impact and, and stand out and um, add value. And you know, one of the things is this idea of being a B Corp and, and doing better. And that's, that's us trying to lead by example so the tagline for Better Human Project is be better and do better. And, you know, we're really, we're continuing 
what the OPP was, but in a broader look. Yeah. So, so you were talking about, you know, columns or pillars, and that's how we look at better human, right? It's yep. performance is just one aspect of being a better human. There's, you know, there's relationships, there's business. So now I'm able to have a wider range of conversations with a wider range of guests. There's no topic, no guest that yep. doesn't fit now. Um, but also it's, it's not just about learning faster or being smarter or being stronger or healthier or living longer. It's posing the fundamental question of why are we pursuing those things and what are we doing when we achieve those ERs, stronger, yeah. faster, bigger, whatever it is. Um, okay, you're whatever superhero you want to be. What are you going to do with it, right? Yeah. Batman, Superman, whoever your superhero is, is irrelevant if they're not using those abilities to make their community or their world a better place. Yeah. And, and that's what we're doing with Better Human Project is trying to highlight people who are doing those things and then show our following, uh, you know, how they can do it in their own world. And ultimately, the big goal here is to create a movement that people can get involved with and in their own way, figure out what it means to be a better human yeah. and, you know, have Better Human Project as just this umbrella uh, movement, sort of like, like, think about like a paleo effects where everyone there is somehow invested in ancestral health, right? Everybody with Better Human Project uh, is invested in bettering their communities and, mm -hmm. and helping people with upward trajectories. So how you do that is, is up to you. We're just trying to present options and, and uh, you know, highlight humans who are already doing it. Totally. Yeah, and I think with all that and how you were talking about the pillars as well, there's all these, there's typically like a few areas that people enter the, this quest for self-betterment. And then once they head that route, that's when you can be like, here, now here's how to think about it. Like, cool, dude, you got ripped, but what does that mean? And then they're like, oh, shit, it actually means something more. And you can, I mean, you see it time and time again, because most of the, the fitness communities online are like probably a 16-year-old kid to a 25-year-old kid who's trying to like figure out their life. And the one thing that they realize they have control over is fitness. And they're mm -hmm. like, I could get ripped. Doesn't matter if I have friends at school. Doesn't matter if I can have a business. It really doesn't matter, but I can get shredded. Mm -hmm. And so they go that route. And then it's like this amazing introduction into, hey, now you can help other people or you can figure out whatever you want to do because now you broke down one of the most complex things in the world, which is taking control of yourself and your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really well said. And I think the important thing there is to at some point transition out of the focus being on you yep. and transfer that skill into some pursuit that in some way helps other people. Um, it's funny you mentioned, you know, oh, cool, you got ripped, like big deal. Like that's, I mean, for me, it was when I started my gym, that was yep. it. That was very much it. It was, you know, I realized like, oh shit, these things I've been pursuing and chasing of, you know, what's my body composition? How much can I squat? Like if that's all that somebody has to say about me at my funeral or that's yeah. all they can put on my tombstone, I fucking wasted my life. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. When we think we're so unique, there's 8 billion of us. Like how many people want to get ripped? A lot. You know, I would say most want to be ripped, but they're not. So, you know, once you get ripped and you're shredded, yeah. Like if you master Instagram, like you're a unique ripped person, but uh, otherwise, that's going to go away. We're all going to be buried in a box under the ground at some point. And exactly. you know, when that stuff disintegrates and, you know, fades away, I want to be remembered for, for something more. I want to have made a difference. So, yeah. uh, you know, that was a big shift for me. Totally. And since we're, we're moving this route, so this is kind of uh, awesome, but I want to dive into, seems like you're, uh, are you stoic, uh, Epicurean? Or what are your viewpoints behind uh, death and just how to perceive uh, life now? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I think I have always kind of prescribed to the, the Bruce Lee advice, you know, yeah. where it's kind of pull from everything um, yep. except uh, what is useful and kind of get rid of the rest. And I, I mean, by definition, there's not a person alive who knows for sure what exactly. happens. Exactly on yeah. the other side. Um, we've got a lot of theories. We've got a lot of, you know, thoughts. We've got a lot of fears and anxiety about it. Um, 
I just know that at some point the existence that I know of right now yeah. is going to no longer happen. Um, and I want to experience and do as much as I can while I'm here. And I think that is the thing that makes life beautiful, but it's also the thing that, that really motivates me. Um, so yeah, if I had to put a label on it, it would just say yeah. freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm similar. I mean, I like some Epicurean, like live now, like everything. And then Stoics like, Hey, you're going to die. Like make sure everything's set up long-term. And it's like, I don't know when you, when you think about time and just, our perception of time, doing what you want to do, becoming a better person, helping others is like literally the number one way to extend your perceived time that you are on earth. So when you're 50, 60, 70, 80, and you're looking back, you're not like, where did life go? Uh, what can I do now? And it's like, well, maybe at 80, there's a pill. And then it's like, you got another 40 years. Good job. But it's like, it's still one of those things that like, unless you understand that like, there's a finish point, enjoy the whole race or like Alan Watts always says is you're not listening to a song in order to get to the end. You listen to a song to experience the song. Do yeah. that. Live yeah. life that way. Yeah. That's well said. Hell yeah. Um, so I did want to move into now fuck your feelings and the, yeah. the mindset behind feelings, not being the dictator and controller of who you are. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, the research was really, really shocking when I first stumbled upon that. Uh, so Antonio Damasio, who, if you may know him from your neuroscience studies, uh, yep. you know, he found out uh, through, you know, treating patients with injuries to particular parts of the brain that up to 95% of our decisions are made based on how we feel in any given moment. And to me, it's in one sense, like if you really stop and think about it, like it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm if you really examine human behavior and how people move through the world, but to hear a number that high um, and to have kind of quantifiable data yeah. on that is incredibly startling. And, and to me, it really uh, explains why so many people in this world fail to live the, the life that they want to live to reach the goals that they have, despite the fact that they said, this is what I want to do, or this is where I want to be. Um, you know, there's the statistics on, on setting goals and achieving them is crazy. Uh, I think it's only, um, 20% of people, only 20% of people set goals. Uh, only, only 30% of the people who set goals actually achieve them. So if you take 30% of the 20%, you're left with 6% of the population who actually sets and achieves their goals. And I mean, no wonder, you know, so many people are, are frustrated and, and, you know, feeling like they're stuck and, you know, wanting help. And, and yeah. you know, so, so for me, it was, okay, everything I've done in the last 10 or 12 years has been in the business of helping people uh, transform themselves, whether it's through nutrition or fitness or uh, personal development. And it's not a lack of information that holds people back. Oh, no. The only thing we want is, you know, it's either on the phone, it's on the computer or it's on our phone. Like, it's not hard to find the information. Now, sorting through it and getting the right information is a different conversation. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is, if you want to do something, you can find out how. Then the rest is up to you. It's all about implementation. Mm -hmm. So therein is, is sort of the rub, and, and that's where most people fall off track. And what... What I found in interviewing neuroscientists and behavioralists and then talking with Olympic athletes and special forces operators and kind of comparing the theory and the application yeah. is that the bigger the goal, the longer it takes, the more points along the way there are for us to be led astray uh, by our feelings and, and those opportunities for us in the moment to say, eh, I don't feel like getting up and doing that workout this morning or man, I'm supposed to be on this you know, podcast with Austin in 10 minutes and I don't really feel like doing it today. Well, dude, fuck your feelings. Like you're, if you are the person you say you are or if you're going to be the person that you want to be, and, and this is another exercise I like to help people with. Um, it's in the book and, and I help a lot of my clients with it. Is, it's called act as if, right? So very few of us actually define our values. Yes. And that's such a weird thing that, you know, Every business writes these arbitrary mission goals yeah. or statements or values or core values and, you know, but, and they're, they're, they're lip service for most of them. Um, 
But as humans, as individuals, how many of us have actually sat down and written out what our values are? How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be described? What do you stand for? Um, come up with four or five of those words. And the exercise that I love to have people do is set a reminder on their phone so that it goes off at the same time every single day, multiple times a day if you want, and it reminds you. It just asks the question, yeah. am I being that person? And then it lists those words. So then when you get in these moments, so I said this earlier, awareness creates choice. Yep. And it's in these moments where we have awareness and we're presenting ourselves with choice, that you fall back on those values. So a lot of experts will say, you know, motivation is bullshit. You know, we know that it's transient. It doesn't yeah. last. If you wait for motivation or inspiration, it's never going to happen. Yes. Yes. Our values never change. It doesn't matter what my mood is or what's going on. My values are always the same. If you're a parent, it's really, really easy to have the value of wanting to be a great parent. Yeah. Right. Um, but so, so let's go back to, like I'm saying, I was using the example of, okay, you know, it's, it's 10 minutes until I have this appointment yep. and, and maybe I don't want to, I don't feel like it. I'm not in that mood today. But if, if we're, if we're looking at those values and then the next step in this, so step one is define your values. Step two is, uh, the, the Jedi mindset trick where you yeah. put those words into your phone. And then step three is act as if act as if you already are that version of you or that person. So another way to think about it is to take this objective view. So you're not looking at yourself, but imagine Oprah or Richard Branson yeah. or, you know, Bill Gates or whoever it is that, that you aspire to be and ask yourself, how would that person handle this situation? How would they move through life? And, you know, the fastest way for us to become the version of us that we want to be is mm -hmm. to start acting like it. Oh yeah. So, you know, if you've got an appointment or a call, you know, if you're a salesman and you don't want to make a cold call, but you've got to hit numbers or you've got to provide for your family, you got to make that damn call and you got to do it right now. Yeah. And that's got to become how you operate all the time, regardless of how you feel. Um, you know, so the book, the title is it's obviously it's provocative. It's designed yeah. to make you stop and then say, what is this? But, you know, there's the neuroscience behind the title. It's the self-talk that we just talked about. Um, you know, so it, it is really relevant and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been fun to put that out there and, and get all kinds of, you know, positive feedback and hear people's success stories. Totally. Yeah. And wow, there's uh, a lot that we can unpack from, uh, what you just went through. Number one, yes, if you're a salesman or, um, I do a lot of cold emails and I will tell you that you do not get rewarded for oftentimes days. And so you cannot rely on that quick dopamine response that, you often get hit with because I mean right now most of us get instant feedback for most things someone doesn't text you back right away you're like what the hell are they dead it's like no they're not dead just like relax because they're doing something but when you talk about knowing your feelings um, and having the feeling of like I don't want to approach an appointment or go to an appointment in 10 minutes the act as if is so important and it is not fake it till you make it. I want to, uh, to divide that because fake it till you make it is the mindset of being fake about something until, Oh, I'm here. Act as if is like the absorption almost. If you, I don't know, I mentally am seeing it mm -hmm. but the absorption of who that person is, the characteristics. And then you are becoming because mm -hmm. if you're acting as if, then you are. I'm big on the, uh, the, the words and the way that your mind perceives the things that you do. And so like a lot of times I'll say, if your actions don't mirror your intentions, then those aren't your intentions. Mm -hmm. Figure out who yeah. you are. If it feels bad, there's probably a reason because you're doing something that isn't in alignment with what we were talking about earlier, your personal beliefs, where you actually want to go and creating that quality piece of work that you were meant to be here for. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really well said. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I, the the actions and intentions to me, and especially with um, Fuck Your Feelings, it becomes one of those um, internal like meta issues, I would say. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just use that as a phrase where you're like, oh, is this really happening? You get that self-talk of like, oh, no, nah, not this. Oh, I did this one thing and I knew I wasn't supposed to. Yeah, I mean, at, 
at the essence of it, it's really, it goes all the way back to what we were talking about in the very beginning. It's, it's taking control of, of your life by taking control of the space between your ears, right? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, if you can master what goes on between your ears, uh, your thoughts, you can master your actions. And then by doing that, you can, you know, create whatever future you want for yourself. Yeah. Master your thoughts, master your actions. Boom. Um, so I need to ask the question cause I always ask this. Do you have any higher leverage skills that have helped you get to where you are? So a higher leverage skill is something that you learn in one area and, uh, basically you can pull it out, extrapolate it and then use it in other areas. So learning to learn is one because then you can learn anything better. Yep. Learning to breathe better, uh, helps you do, uh, sports, sex, all that better. Um, but it can be a mindset or a mental frame, but it's something that you pick up and you're like, literally I can put it here and boom, this is working a lot better. I've never heard uh, a benefit of breathing touted as being better at sex. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, if you read any of David Detta's work, um, he goes into kind of just how to use breath for, uh, sexual energy and stuff. It's very interesting. Nice. Nice. Um, I think the answer to your question, I mean, both of those two, breathing and, and learning to learn have been incredibly powerful in my life. But I think even pulling back further, um, a more you know, yeah. zoomed out view would just be the belief that there's nothing we can't do. Awesome. Um, I, I think that is something that uh, is, a, is both a conscious and a subconscious thought in my mind as I go through life. And um, you know, when I had my gym house of strength, we had a rule, you were not allowed to say I can't. Um, and, uh, this is actually, it's from John Carlton who yeah. said, um, you know, to say I can't is to say I won't. So if I said to you, um, you know, I can't be, I can't speak like yeah. Tony Robbins or, um, I can't play the guitar like favorite musician, right? Yeah. What you're really saying is I'm not willing to do what it takes to get to that level because just like us, they're human beings. They have the same brain. They have the same 10 digits. They have the same physical and, you know, hardware, software, whatever. There's nothing that, that they have learned to do that we can't learn to do um, if we're willing to put in the work. So, you know, if your favorite musician is 60 and has been playing the guitar for 50 years yeah. and you want to be that good, be prepared to play the guitar until your fingers bleed for 50 years. And then maybe you'll be that good. But don't say I can't because to say I can't is, is a cop out. And it's, um, it's a way to let yourself off the hook for the responsibility that we have, um, you know, for our actions, right? So, um, you know, I think that fundamental belief that there's nothing we can't do, there's a difference between, you know, yeah. won't do and, and will do. Um, but that is the question. And, um, you know, I think just that fundamental belief that there's nothing we can't do, uh, gives us kind of the green light to do whatever it is that we want. Hell yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, there's even the, the notion that when you say they can't and you put a limiting factor in someone else, you're going to treat them differently. Um, mm -hmm. when typically it is, they won't. And we see this in politics all the time. They can't do it. Help them. Mm, they won't do it. Right. Let's figure that out later. Right. Um, no, that is awesome. Yeah, that is, that's the mindset. It's, uh, it's a little more evolved, I would say, than beginner's mindset because it's the approach of like literally everything is possible. You just have to put in the work and realize that you have this one life. Every other human got to where they are doing something, practicing, and they all start similar. You start at a similar pace. Like, yes, of course, some people have a head start or they fall behind but you can get just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, yep, you're absolutely right. Hell yeah. Um, so currently are you questioning anything? And so this could be politics, religion, science, the way right. doorknobs work, whatever it is, but something that in mass consensus you keep hearing and you're like, I don't think it works that way. Oh man. I question everything. Uh, the question is which one do I want to let out of my head and yeah. into the world? Um, uh, let's see. I, my, my brain just works in, in that way. It's so weird. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm contemplating creativity and, and boundaries and, and creative process creation a lot. Um, I know that's not really the answer to your question. What am no, I questioning uh, in the world right now? 
Um, I'll give you one in, in the nutrition realm. So uh, back in November, I did the carnivore diet. And um, I did an experiment with that. I did a lot of blood work. I've talked a lot about it. I've interviewed experts on both sides. Um, my degree is food science and human nutrition. So, you know, it's not like I'm just some dude that said, you know, hey, I'm going to eat meat for a month and see what yeah. happens. Um, I am questioning what we think we know about the need for vegetables and fiber, uh, micronutrients, um, not whether or not we need micronutrients, but sources. Um, you know, this is one that uh, always ruffles people's feathers, but, you know, organ meats contain more micronutrients than uh, any vegetable you can name. Um, you know, so a, a diet that contains the right amount of, you know, liver and, and heart and kidney uh, will provide more micronutrients than, you know, any vegetarian diet. Um, so, one of the ways that I pose this question to, to other people is, um, you know, the word microbiome did not show up in the scientific literature until the late 1990s, maybe even the year 2000. So we're looking at 20 years uh, of study in this field. Tell me one other part of the human anatomy that we have understood accurately and fully in 20 years of study. Exactly. The answer is we haven't. So, so the study of the microbiome, the understanding of it is in its infancy at best. I mean, we're still actually in the taxonomy stage where we're still naming parts of yeah. this, right? So, so let's pull back a little bit on being gut health experts um, and understand or, or just be okay. Just accept that we don't know what we think we know. Yep. Uh, we don't know as much as we think we know. And you know, we may find out in 30, 40, 50 years that the things we think we know now aren't right. And that's what science is all about. And yeah. it's so funny to see how strongly people hold on to certain dogmas or beliefs. And, um, you know, I, I interviewed Mark Sisson a couple of years ago, and he said mm -hmm. people hold on to their dietary beliefs more tightly than they hold on to their religious beliefs. And it's so true. Um, so I, I just, that's one that I'm questioning and yes. contemplating. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm all with... Uh... Scientific literature, I think, is one of the most BS uh, just areas there is because a company can pay to get anything approved. Um, have you read the book Healing is Voltage? I have not. So super interesting book. But uh, it's kind of a physics standpoint on health versus a uh, chemistry-based uh, standpoint okay. on health. And he's talking about Roxxon and how they paid scientists and they paid copywriters. The copywriters wrote the actual scientific literature, the scientists were just paid to say, yeah, we did that. Kills like mm, 1.5 million people, the drug. But you have people still like, no, it's a good drug. Here's the scientific literature. It's like, dude, what are you actually doing right now? Yeah. Think. Yeah, it's, it's appalling. Uh, Dr. Jason Fung is somebody who uh, has highlighted a lot of some of those misdoings in, in scientific literature. Mm -hmm. He had a great blog post where he actually showed – um, I, I think it was the calendar year 2015 or 16, mm -hmm. I forget which, but, but he actually had the numbers of, of how much money were, was paid, um, you know, to the people yeah. running those, uh, scientific journals, um, you know, to get studies published. Um, you know, so, I mean, he had the smoking gun. It's not just like somebody saying, oh, they're corrupt. It was, no, this is how much money yeah. these journal editors were paid for these studies to be published. And then those are the studies that, you know, are getting, um, you know, FDA approval for certain drugs or, you know, whatever it is. So it, yeah. it, it always comes down to, to money and it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very scary thing. So, you know, yeah. I think what you and I are both trying to get at is, you know, kind of be skeptical and do your own research and, and yes. read. And that's why, like I said, in the beginning of this, you know, when I wanted to get into nutrition and, and training, I never wanted to be the guy relying on someone else telling me what to do. I want to understand the system so that I can figure out what I need to do, yes. whatever result I want. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of this comes down to like understanding how the body works, but how you feel, because we've all separated um, the like warm hands and feet, good sign that things are working well, your veins showing, um, having energy. Uh, if you're, tip of your nose and ears are cold, like not a good sign. If you squeeze your fist and you have inflammation always, not a good sign. Like 
if we can train people or teach people once again to start to understand how to feel in their body, these different things that are happening, then yeah, when you take that drug and it just completely screws you up or when you got rid of brain fog and now you ate, you took this amazing new supplement that's being hyped and you don't feel good. It's not the sub or it's not you. It's the supplement. And it doesn't matter how good the marketing was. It probably isn't right for you. Yep. But I want to unpack a little bit more about your creativity and how you're uh, now contemplating or thinking about how it really works. Because I, I think um, more than questioning the things, uh, the nutrition, the aspects of uh, the practical, physical, a lot of times the questioning of the mental and like how we're told creativity should work or the experts and what they're saying often is a lot more impactful um, in order to hear and, and think differently. So I think one of, one of the best pieces of advice I got um, was in the practical realm, but I think it led me to yeah. some of that more esoteric, if, if you will, where you know, the advice was, you know, when you look at others, um, don't do what they did, mm -hmm. seek what they sought. Mm. Right. So, so in your, uh, in some of your past professional experiences with maybe copywriting or, or yeah. ads or whatever. So, you know, you look at like, like if we look at somebody who has an ad that's doing really, really well, a lot of people would just try to do exactly what they did yep. rather than deconstructing it and trying to figure out, okay, what were, what result were they trying to elicit? How did they do it? What, what were they seeking with every aspect of this? And and so, so to me, that's one of the things that, you know, I always, I, I try to deconstruct everything. Yeah. And, um, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, um, oh, yeah. like unashamed, um, yeah. you know, yeah. but, but I think, you know, the way that he has been able to write songs for more than 40 years, um, you know, my favorite album is an album that he put out in 1979. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, music that he wrote in the seventies and eighties is still socially relevant. So, you know, it fascinates me. How can someone write something that is at, at equal times poignant yeah. yet abstract so that no matter who you are listening to it, no matter what your demographic or your socioeconomic background, you can hear that and relate, um, whether it was in, you know, New yeah. Jersey in 1978 or, you know, California in, you know, 2017. You know, yeah. there's... There's real art in that. And to me, real art, real creation is something that is timeless and universally relatable. Um, and even for something to be universally relatable, there's a dichotomy in that yeah. two word phrase, right? Um, so it's just, I know this is some weird shit, but it's like, I, I when I, yeah. I, I love to think about that and, and how do people and and then how can I create things that uh, could be described that way or could be relatable or, or could impact and help you know many people in yeah. that way because because to me that's that's why I'm exploring it is you know how the, the reason for pursuing that is so that you know the communication can be there so that then ultimately the impact can be there yeah totally and I think that's the with art I think you see this most often is uh, artists, writers, anything like that. They get these, uh, they create these things which will last forever. Like if you look at the Mona Lisa, like it always is going to have these like, oh my God, I discovered this or oh my God, like look at this, this part, it's amazing. And it seems like that freedom or that self-awareness, but the, the ability to map your consciousness into something well, uh, well, creating something that is true to you, completely true, a hundred percent true, helps with resonance. Um, it's just like the honesty thing. Once again, yeah. like be honest. If you're honest, like shit comes your way. Yeah, yeah, and that's what's so funny about you know, kind of trying to bring it all full circle is like you know, resonance, and you know, that's something that is more physical than chemical or biological, yeah. and you know whether you're a DO or an MD or, or a naturopath or, or just, you know, not even in the medical field. I mean, there, there has to be a holistic integrative approach to yes. anything and everything that we do, whether it's health or business or relationships, whatever. So, um, you know, the, 
the, the quantum mechanics yep. of this universe are undeniable. That's dude. Yeah. I'm huge into quantum. I do Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditations. I'm big into um, all of quantum physics and uh, it's a whole universe that until someone gets into, they're like, that's quack. None of that makes any sense. It's kind of like uh, LSD or any of that stuff where like anybody who hasn't done it a lot of times uh, wants to be like, make it illegal, get rid of all this stuff. Like no one should be near it. Like it's propaganda. It's bad. And then you're like, you do it one time and you're like, okay, I kind of understand things a lot differently. <laughs> yeah. um, and the world's a little bit more clear. Colors are a little bit more vibrant. Okay. This is, this was good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, you can't knock something until you understand it. But with physics, like I know Einstein would go back and forth. He's like quantum exists. Quantum doesn't exist. Quantum exists. Cause he just, I think if you can confuse Einstein with quantum, it's real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's an interesting concept. So is there currently anything that you're obsessed with? I would say it's this, this creative kind of exploration. Um, yeah. uh, just trying to figure out how I can utilize that to become a better communicator and yeah. better creator. Um, because I understand that um, that that is sort of it, it's it's a hindrance to being able to have the greater impact that I want to have. So um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I would say that that's kind of where my uh, obsession lies right now. That and you know one of my my passion areas in in Better Human Project is uh, you know getting to work with a lot of organizations uh and, and helping them dial in high performance functioning and yeah. uh, communication leadership i mean those are uh, that's definitely kind of an obsession right now yeah i think it's so cool also to see um a lot of people dive into a new field or a new thing and like you just then realize how much cool stuff there is to just figure out like if you approach things from that like i'm gonna learn everything like what we were talking about with your higher leverage skill the ability to like go and be like oh all this is learnable i just have to figure it out and then put it to use mm -hmm. it's amazing once you develop that mindset and then start to use that mindset in whatever you're doing yep, yep. yeah you're like digging away you're like oh more gold cool okay how can yeah. i use this yeah i mean my buddy logan gelberg says i mean that 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 decision to go right and and pursue that thing is is the most highly transferable skill uh you know that we can uh, acquire and, and it's it's so true i mean um you know i think that's why i said you know the high leverage skill is just realizing there's nothing you can't do yeah literally and uh that's that's what we're gonna leave it with there is nothing that you can't do where can people find you before we sign off uh, so my website is ryanmuncie.com. Uh, the book, Fuck Your Feelings, is available on Amazon, or you can get it on my site. Mm -hmm. If you get it on my site, you will get an autographed copy along with a free 20-minute call with me. Uh, oh. So, you know, incentive yeah. to buy it from my site. And uh, it's the same price there as it would be on Amazon. Um, and then social media, my favorite platform is Instagram. Uh, totally. So it's at Ryan Muncie with an underscore. And then, of course, the podcast is Better Human Project. Hell yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Ryan. And awesome. Thanks for having me, man. This has been a blast. Of course, man. Thank you.